The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the 11th Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm Professor John Jackson and I'll serve as the host for today's event. To uh, kick off the event, we'd like to call on Admiral Chatfield for her greetings. Admiral? Well, thank you, Professor Jackson. And uh, thank you, Professor Norton, for uh, joining us today. We're looking forward to your lecture. I'm here with uh, David Scoville, my husband, and uh, we're delighted to welcome you all to the Issues in National Security Lecture Series. It's so nice to see some familiar faces out there. And uh, I would call you all out, but uh, I wanna get, really get to the subject matter at hand. I, I think David uh, will be introducing our uh, family support group lecture. Uh, and so I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here as a participant in our national security lecture series. Thank you, Admiral David. As I mentioned at each lecture with these uh, lectures are originally established to provide a way to give the spouses and significant others of our students a taste of what the North, North Naval War College experience is like. Well, we've expanded that now and we're very glad to have uh, people from all around the world joining us, uh, Naval War College Foundation members, international sponsors and many others. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we'll be doing an additional seven lectures between now and May of 2021, so we hope you can come back. An announcement detailing the various dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our Public Affairs Office. Looking ahead, on Tuesday, the 23rd of February, we'll hear from Professor Peter Dutton, who will speak about the strategic dynamics of the South China Sea. So, on with the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat function of Zoom and we'll get to them at the conclusion of our presentation. I suspect that many of you have joined us today to learn what a feral city might be. The dictionary defines feral as existing in a wild or untamed state. And the term feral cats refers to those annoying cats that live a wild existence in our neighborhoods. In his brown, groundbreaking research, Dr. Rick Norton coined the term feral cities to describe a huge, metropolitan, metro, <laughs> a huge metropolitan area with a population of more than one million people that is largely ungoverned and out of control. This afternoon, he will discuss the implications of feral cities and will describe ways that the international community can deal with them. Professor Norton is a graduate of Tulane University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's also a retired United States Navy commander. While in the Navy, he served extensively at sea on cruisers and destroyers, as well as shore tours in the Navy's Office of Legislative Affairs and on the Navy staff. His regional areas of expertise include Africa and South America. Well, before someone labels my control of this lecture series as feral, I'd like to pass the baton on to Professor Rick Norton. Rick. Thank you, John, and thank you, Admiral. It's a pleasure to be back at the lecture series. And without further ado, permit me to share my screen and we'll get going. There we go. Well, as John mentioned, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to start out with definitions. And so um, my definition, which is in a state of flux, as is research always, it's a, a feral city could be defined as a metropolis in which the government has lost the ability to maintain the rule of law within the city's boundaries. but uh, the city remains a functioning actor in the greater international political system. Uh, back in 2004, when the idea first occurred to me, the research was, could this happen? And since then, it's been more of a documentation of how it's happening and some of the new permutations that are being involved with this. Well, uh, we're going to start off with a basic. Some of you may have uh, come across this factoid before, but uh, humans are now urban animals. More of us live in a city today than live on farms or in rural environments. And it's going to keep going that way. And this is not an issue of controversy. Everybody agrees on it, including the United Nations. And um, you can see from the, the chart in the upper left that 
Africa and is going to be the next major growth area of population in urban environments. And you will see that this is indeed the case. Cities, uh, it's interesting when you talk about cities, what people's Im what images come to people's minds. Uh, my, my favorite description is they are gleaming poetry and steel and glass, the, where the best of us um, kind of congregate, where you can get a slice of pizza at 3.30 in the morning and find a bookstore devoted exclusively to mystery novels. That's true. But cities can also be zones of despair, inequality, poverty, crime, ecological disasters, and both can exist within the same geographic area. It makes them a uniquely man-made phenomenon and, and more than deserving of study. And there is a lot of literature out there about how to keep cities healthy, how to make cities healthy, how to build cities healthy. And we'll talk about that. All right, we talked about growth. Well, last year, India dominated the fastest growing cities in the world. Today, it's the continent of Africa. And from Tete, Mozambique to Bujumbura, Burundi, African cities are on the rise. Uh, this is going to probably be a, a kids of affair for some time. And um, you can see for yourself some of them are. It's interesting that, that Tanzania has two, and so does Niger. And so does the DRC. Okay, uh, there was a period of time when the, uh, one of the most serious questions about the research was, do feral cities occur more frequently in fragile states? And failed in fragile states, uh, the, the research in that developed about the same time I started looking at feral cities. A former professor at the War College, Jim Miskell, was uh, integral to that research. And the surprising answer was no. Uh, there does not appear to be a connection between fragile states and feral cities, although some feral cities are in fragile states. But cities that were developed, uh, uh, determined to be fragile, I'm sorry, uh, you can see from the, uh, you can see from the slide that there's a lot more red in non-fragile states than there are in fragile states. In fact, 2,037 cities are in non-fragile states and only 99 are in fragile ones. Um, this has been a tried and true slide from, my, from me for almost a decade. And it's reasonable to ask is, Mogadishu still the postal feral city? And by all statistics, accounts, et cetera, the answer is yes. And so Mogadishu remains uh, feral, or at least more feral than not. And it, it demonstrates how hard it is to recover from um, an episode of true ferality. And then during the Somali Civil War, uh, Operation Black Hawk Down, et cetera, it was bad and has not necessarily gotten all that much better, although it is better. In order to determine where feral cities come from and where they might be going, I developed this kind of diagnostic tool. And it's, although it's an eye chart for which I apologize, um, it's, it's fairly simple to understand. Um, when I was in the Navy, we loved uh, stoplight charts and this is a stoplight chart. Green is good, yellow is caution and red is bad. And it, it, this is a way to take a snapshot of a city. And I've divided this over time. Originally there were four, there were four ca categories. Now there are five, there may be six. Uh, the categories were governance, economy, services, security, and civil society. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of figure out what you would want to find in a green city. Everything from um, good government, not corrupt. You don't have to pay a bribe for everything you do for services. The economy is robust with lots of foreign investment. Civil society, people get along. It's rich, robust. Uh, they are co the relationships between civil society and the, the government are cordial and cooperative and constructive. Um, as the city begins to become feral, and it can become feral, it can move toward ferality in several of these categories or one of these categories, um, but it, it gets to the point where eventually uh, there is no security unless you provide your own, either through your own means or through association with other entities. Civil society is fractured. Uh, services are at a minimum, if at all, available, so you have to kind of fend for yourself. Uh, there is little legitimate business. Well, that was a surprise. I'll talk about that. And at best, in terms of government, you have negotiated zones of control. And we're actually seeing that more and more. And at worst, there simply is no um, central government or local government. Now, that's rare uh, if, if it ever actually happens. All right, so governance. Uh, my first, by the way, I, I should have been very clear. My first disclaimer, everything I'm going to talk about is uh, my opinion, my and not any way reflective of that of the United States government, the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, the Naval War College, or any other group I may or now or have been or will be associated with. Uh, and a second disclaimer for this time, uh, this slide. 
Transparency International has their new figures for 2020. Uh, they have not yet published in an available form their corruption map. So this is the corruption map of 19, 2019 that I have altered to say 2020 because um, the, the important rankings, it's almost the same. There's some movement up and down inside the categories. And as soon as the new charts come out, I'll be plugging them in. The United States, people always wanna know how do we stand? And the answer is not as well as we used to. Uh, last year, we were down one spot and now we are down two additional. So uh, we're not moving in the right direction. And it was interesting because it, that more, it, the main reason we slipped had to do with financial transactions, security, transparency, et cetera. Uh, Somalia and Sudan, again, remain tied for last place at 179. Economy. When I first began studying this phenomenon on feral cities, my assumption was, and it seemed to be backed up, that what co economy would exist would be a legal and subsistence. And for a while, that looked like that was true. Uh, for example, in Mogadishu, uh, the, the, the other African cities, but Mogadishu is a great example. Uh, when the cot supply shows up in the morning, and cot is a mild narcotic, which is chewed for the most part, uh, the cot market opens up, people buy their drugs, and the rest of the day is pretty well shot, and then it happens again the next day. There are also, at the time, there were significant open arms markets. Uh, there's a, a colleague of mine who actually um, has a scale. He, he judges the danger of a city by the price of a hand grenade. And at its worst, Mogadishu sold hand grenades for $5 a pop. Um, so you can imagine how bad that was. Uh, the, the boy with the shark, again, subsistence. You catch a fish in the, in the morning, you try to sell it to the locals, and the price goes down as the sun gets hotter and the fish gets riper. What I didn't expect, uh, to be honest, was that there are some high-tech industries that operate out of cities that are approaching ferality. One of them is telecommunications. The old days in which we measured progress by miles of copper wire to support telephones are gone. Uh, with a tower and a satellite dish, you can have communications. Uh, in fact, some companies who provide communications in these areas find it relatively liberating because uh, rules of, air, of uh, bandwidth and frequencies and all the controls we normally associate with this aren't present. And the, uh, the amount of actual hardware they risk losing is minimal and there's money to be made. Other things surprise me. The, the University of Mogadishu, Mogadishu U operates today and has been all along. Now it's a pretty harsh way to teach. You occasionally have to duck at the, in the worst of times when gunfire would come through the walls, but it's, um, it's fascinating that the urge for education still uh, is powerful enough to drive people's behavior. And a while back, uh, BBC did a piece on a family living in Mogadishu at the worst of times. The mom had lost a foot and she was, uh, she was making sure her kids kept going to school. Now they were madrasas, they were taught by Islamic um, imams, but that, that need to educate is um, perhaps baked into us. Services, in a great city, there are all kinds of services. Besides health and sanitation and transportation and security, there's also parks and recreation, uh, places to, there are arboreums and museums. In a feral city, uh, no. You're not going to get that, and it's going to get worse and worse as you become more and more feral. This is Mumbai, the city of Mumbai, and the slum of Darawai, which has about, as a last count that I looked at, 850,000 people living in it. It's the world's largest slum. And services are an issue, sanitation, hospital, et cetera. And that has had an impact, or that issue has been greatly impacted, or has contributed to the impact of COVID-19, which we'll talk about. Within many of these areas, and this is again Darabai, the great Indian city, uh, services are provided by a variety of actors, uh, many of which are non-governmental, and many of which are humanitarian in nature. And these are just some. Nazio is basically uh, education and job opportunity looking for handicapped people. The Toya Foundation speaks for itself. Neptune is an attempt to get uh, mentally uh, distressed people off the streets and into a zone of safety. There's a lawyer's collection. Uh, Child Help Foundation is highly rated. The number one uh, NGO in Mumbai, I'm sorry, Darby today is Humanitarian Aid International. And so there's a great variety, but it does raise a question. Now, the Indian government allows, permits, and encourages these NGOs to operate within the city, uh, the, the slum city of Darby. But when you think about it, these organizations are performing functions 
that the government normally would. There's a kind of a social contract. And in, in the United States, we expect um, there to be medical services available, that water will be clean for drinking, et cetera. These organizations do this instead of the Indian government. There are, uh, in Darvai, there are people's courts, which have been empowered by the Indian government, but are extrajudicial in terms of the normal governmental apparatus. And so, you know, locals are basically adjudicating cases. That's another example where you can say people are really resilient and they find ways to work around problems. Or you can say this is another case where the government cannot provide services that most states would expect to be given to its city dwellers and somebody else, some other entity is picking up the slack. Now in some cities, as we'll see, that provision of those services, medical, power, et cetera, are performed by criminal organizations and that changes the dynamic of the city extensively in terms of how do people feel about their government and then their government. This is Lagos. Lagos is a, an exciting, bustling city with a, dark, with a long and rich history. Um, it also is one of the largest cities in the world and it is growing exponentially. It grows so fast that I would argue uh, nobody knows exactly how big Lagos is because it grows so fast. We, we take a satellite picture, you can kind of map in the outlines and get square footage. But within that number, there are places where people, truly the zones of ecological devastation are so grim that people can't live there. The mayor certainly doesn't know at any given minute how big it is. And the same is true of population. Um, you can make a guess, you can make an educated guess, and you'll probably be ballpark. But it's not like Portsmouth where you can pretty well assure that as long as you're tracking births at the hospital and deaths, you know how many people live in Portsmouth. Uh, there are real environmental issues from a city of this size. Now, there are some security concerns. For years, Lagos was known as the capital of um, internet scam. So if you were ever contacted by Princess Lamoco saying, if you send me $15,000, I will split the $4.5 billion my dad stashed in her mattress. And uh, I'm still waiting, but I'm sure that it's just a matter of time until she'll pony up her half of the deal. Um, and uh, the more reality of this, though, is that Unfortunately, many people, age seniors in the United States, et cetera, are preyed upon. My favorite named gang that did this was the Yahoo Yahoo Boys. Um, and, it, and rather an insulting aside, uh, cyber criminals, internet criminals in Lagos have, are, are very dismissive of people in the United States and their ability not to be scammed. It's almost as if you're going to start somebody on this track, of, on this career path, you begin with U.S. citizens because they're easy. If you're really good at it, you scam the French. And there have been times when French citizens have actually reverse scammed the scammers. So uh, I don't know if we should feel good about being you know, you know, trusting or if we should feel bad about being cyber chumps, but there you have it. Uh, security, um, and I put the primus inter pares because in the different categories, I'm beginning to think that security is number one. Without a secure environment, it's very hard to provide the rest of the services that go with it. Although certainly governance and security go hand in hand, a corrupt uh, ruling society or corrupt ruling system of a city does not tend to produce good security and perhaps vice versa. This is Johannesburg. Johannesburg is up here because it was my inspiration for this, this now a decades more path of exploration. I was in Joburg in 2000, I was attending a conference and it was an amazing experience. The central business district was more deserted than populated. It was like something out of Blade Runner. And I, I couldn't tell for a long time if, if it was just because Joburg was becoming an African city with a lot of black population, or if it really was kind of in the grips of something different. And a few things have told me that it was different. The, the number one is the stock exchange. That's the national, the national stock exchange in the lower right. In 2000, the South African government moved their national stock exchange from Joburg to Stanton, a suburb about 20 miles away. That's the equivalent of the US or New York moving the New York Stock Exchange from Wall Street to Rye, New York. And the reason they did it was because stockbrokers were no longer safe. The security of the institution and its personnel were so compromised that the government decided that it would be better to move the facility. That's a fairly big red flag about the ability to control a city. Um, uh, just uh, recent checking, um, the, the new issue in South Africa, crime has always been an issue, and the South Africans have strove mightily to get a handle on this. Now, this is not in any way to disparage their efforts, 
Uh, but it's a it, it's an uphill battle, and in some cases, it's the remnants of apartheid and political uh, uh, infighting. But the the new thing is kind of odd. There's there's been huge spikes in raging xenophobia, and the the comment you hear is crime in South Africa. It's all because of those migrants. Migrants from where? Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, any of the neighboring villages. Now that's not true. Uh, certainly, there are crimes associated with migrating people. But there's a lot of indigenous crime in South Africa, perhaps much more than there is being brought over the border. But as a result of this kind of idea, we're seeing xenophobic crowds, beatings, assaults uh, that does not make things easier for the city of Joburg or the state of South Africa. Hijackings are still rampant in Johannesburg. I thought certainly in 21 years there would have been a, uh, an improvement. Still pretty dangerous. Uh, truck jackings is also a, a big area. Uh, business, robberies of business have gone up, uh, not so much. Others, there are, there's good news in other places. Murders are down, to, um, it's still an excessive rate. Um, and then home invasions are down. Uh, another, perhaps another symptom, two of them, one is Seven Arrows. Seven Arrows is a security company. And if you have the rand, you have the money, Seven Arrows will do everything from escort your family to and from school and work, they'll protect your house, it's like ADT, uh, we see it here, on steroids. And that includes everything from covering your trip and rescuing you if you get in trouble. It's a, it's a remarkable um, phenomenon, but it's, it's, again, waited for the rich, and it's become, a, it's become an entrepreneurial opportunity in a niche that should have been filled by the state. And it's, I think, another example where central states and central governments are losing control of some of their cities. Uh, part of the issue may be that Joburg is it's a hard, it's, it's very hard to find a chief of police who sticks the course. This is Liz Angie McCausey. She's been the chief of police since March, and hopefully we, everybody wishes her well. But she's still acting, which is a little odd, because you would think by now she would be, um, um, not March, I'm sorry, uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, she would be confirmed. But the last two chiefs that I know of were, had been acting chiefs the whole time. And that's because of political infighting at the, at the, at the higher levels of government in the city. Okay. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, in the 2020 list for the most deadly cities, the most or dangerous cities, and I think there's a, you can make, there's a difference, is out. Um, the thing you'll notice right away is that they're all in South America. This has been a tendency for the last several years. If you expand the list to 50 or 100, it becomes more diverse. Uh, but And it will, within South America, three countries hold one, two, and three, and that's uh, Venezuela, uh, Mexico, and Brazil. Brazil hasn't had an issue for a while, and we'll talk why about that. Uh, Mexico, it's almost all cartel and drug-related, and Venezuela is what happens when a, a state really begins to go toward failure and systems begin to implode upon each other. And then when people have no food, they tend to resort to other measures to get it, et cetera. And I'm, I, I put that as strictly as a, a result of state failure. Okay, so I talked about how if you expand the list, you get more diversity. And you actually pick up three cities in Africa, all of which are in South Africa for now. Um, you also see why South America and the Caribbean are right up there. It's not just those first 10. Uh, Mexico technically is in North America, and so they provide the majority of North American cities. Uh, this one, this again, 2019, Los Cabos was the number one city, but now it's Tijuana. Uh, I just gave that away. But four cities in the United States have remained on the list. They've been there for the last three years. St. Louis, Baltimore, uh, Detroit and New Orleans, and the most dangerous of these is St. Louis, uh, which is interesting. Um, Baltimore has always been a hard city. My beloved New Orleans, which I consider myself at least, uh, uh, my, I graduated in New Orleans. My family's from Louisiana, my, on my mom's side. So I've always thought of it as kind of my city. A rootless child has to fix their city. And it's, um, it is grim. It's always been a hard city, a tough city to live in. Got to be careful but it makes the top four. And I, I can't really talk to Detroit and, and St. Louis, perhaps somebody else can, uh, in terms of why they may remain on the list. But that's there. Notice there are none in Asia. Okay, so Tijuana right now is number one, not a distinction that you'd wanna have. Uh, most of it is because of violence and it's almost all related to gang slash cartel drug violence. 
Um, cartels are still fighting over turf. The fighting has turned brutal and deadly. Um, there is actually a patron saint of narcos now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with this has come a glamorization of the drug life. We see it in the TV show Weeds and uh, some of the music that's coming out of uh, Mexico and some of the other areas. This violence is spreading to the United States. One of the, the most dangerous cities in the top 50 was Nuevo, uh, so it was, uh, yeah, Nuevo Laredo, and that's on the Mexican side of the border. But drug violence is now moving into the United States. Uh, this is in part because drug lords seeking safer environments moved over the border and violence has followed them. In the past, just to do a quick run by, uh, last year, Los Cabos, Mexico, that, that wonderful resort town was number one and it was drugs. Uh, Caracas had it for uh, 2018, and that's related to the Venezuela meltdown, as I think of it. And in 2017, it was San Pedro Sula of the Honduras, and that was drugs again. Now, just because you're on the list doesn't mean you can't have a wonderful life in that city. I, I know people in Joburg, for example, there's one guy who blogs, says, look, it's a, or Cape Town's another one. These are wonderful cities. You just have to be smart. You know, they're in, having been a resident of Miami for several years, there's some truth to that. Um, visitors who complain about getting robbed, you feel bad about them. You say, when did this happen? And it was 2 a.m. Where did this happen? An unlit alley going to the beach. And it's like, oh, okay, um, you're really stupid. And then there's another one where it's a classic crime in Miami. I left, uh, I left my expensive watch, my really expensive watch and my sneaker when I went into the water, into the ocean. And when I came back, the watch was gone. It was like, well, yeah, you know, you're tempting honest people with that. But the crime we're talking about in this case goes far beyond the targets of opportunity. Now, this is almost always organized violence. Um, again, Venezuela may be a special case, and that's kind of common. All right, so when I'm talking about cities and you talk about security, and I'm still on the security kick for a while, uh, part of it is weapons availability. Depending where you are, it may be cheaper to buy an AK-47 than it is to buy next month's groceries. Uh, it is highly complex human terrain. Not only are there divisions of ethnicity and background, history, neighborhoods, family, but there is also economic strata, uh, mobility issues, et cetera. And so if you don't really know that city, it's very easy to make mistakes. And perhaps some of you who have experience with old cities, uh, you know, perhaps an example is Boston, uh, trying to discern which criminal gang controlled what part of the city and et cetera in the, in the old days, uh, now that Whitey's gone, um, it's tough. It's also demanding physical terrain. Part of my research in this brought me into how do you fight in cities? And the answer is not very easily. Uh, city combat sucks up infantry and armor. It causes more psychological damage in combat of, of different, uh, in different environments, which is, again, surprising. Um, defenders have an advantage because they know the city. When you knock down a building, you simply create more places to hide. Uh, you can think of perhaps the in the Italian campaign in World War II, when we knocked the, the uh, monastery at uh, Monte Cassino down, the Germans just hid in the rubble. So that's tough. And then there's a real question about how much training and how well was it received that you give security forces that are trying to maintain law and order. These are Afghan police, and I have not asked this year, but in the past, they were not rated especially highly. The Afghan army was rated much more highly. And the problems were corruption and lack of diligence and a, a whole slew of things that go with a poorly, perhaps a poorly trained, and, and, and or in this case, a training didn't take, and poorly paid uh, police force. And we'll talk, I'm gonna talk about New Orleans in a little bit, and the same thing applied to New Orleans. Okay, when law enforcement fails, people seek alternatives. Uh, in this case, militias. This is a city of Lebanon, where the militias were long a part of the, the, the urban terrain. Well-armed criminal gangs, and we see that more and more. And even in Mexico, where the, the police are heavily armed, uh, from time to time, the cartel membership simply outshoots them with better and heavier weapons. And more in Mexico later. Private security forces, much like Seven Arrows, are on the rise. And what police remains becomes militarized. They stop looking like the cop on the beat and they look like SWAT. Uh, there's another issue to that is that cops become another gang. Um, and sometimes the numbers can be astonishing. Mexico City has more than 90,000 policemen. That's more people under arms than Canada has soldiers. And there are still Mexican senators who say 
the police are as much of a problem as are the gangs. I'm not going there, I'm not that familiar with the internal workings of Cuyadad de Mexico's uh, law enforcement, but uh, it is not, you don't have necessarily feel safe when a traffic cop comes up to you. Well, that's probably true in the United States as well, uh, if you're in Mexico City. All right, uh, this is Brazil. Brazil is a, a, a special case, one I'm kind of fond of. Back in 2005, the PCC, the Primero Comandante del Capital, it's a, it's a gang now viewed as a terrorist organization. Their leaders were in jail. And the Brazilians were going to move them to high security, segregated, separated cells. And from jail with illegal cell phones, et cetera, they ordered their gangs to go to war in Sao Paulo. Uh, more than 500 buses were burned. Uh, the, the local police were fought to a standstill. And in the end, there was a negotiated settlement. That's pretty bad when you think on it. Also in Brazil, uh, you have the, uh, the issue of uh, power theft. Uh, electricity is tapped illegally from city provided uh, conduits and is sent into favelas. This is, of course, the Brazilian slum, not just in Sao Paulo, but in Rio and other major cities. You have lots and lots of informal housing, which is interesting. Uh, you may remember that Brasilia was designed to be a model city, uh, and it was and is to some degree. <coughs> Pardon me. But informal settlements have grown up around it. And as a result, um, the, the, the ability of law enforcement to extend into those favelas, many of which are controlled by criminal gangs, has been severely limited. In the past, the Brazilians have even resorted to using their military to conduct what amounts to assaults and raids into their own city's territory. They can be successful for a time, but when they pull out, in comes the, the, the criminal or the gang restores its leadership. A friend of mine at the Providence Foreign Council of uh, Relations Foreign, Council of Foreign Relations uh, talked about his daughter. When I gave this lecture, he was very surprised and said, but Rick, my daughter goes to Rio every year and she works in a clinic and nothing bad ever happens to her. I said, well, that's great. Now, where's the clinic? And it was in Los Alamos, you know, one of the worst favelas. I said, well, why do you think no one's ever you know, menaced or threatened or much less harmed your daughter? I said, well, that's simple. The cartel that owns that favela would never let anything like that happen to her. And so I kind of looked at them and said, well, you just made my point. You know, and and the, the reason why the favelas do that, of course, is they are seen as providing medical care to the people of that area. And uh, in terms of are you a doctor or are you simply somebody else? If, if you fix my abuela's foot or cure my, my dad's glaucoma, you're a doctor, particularly when nobody else is interested in fixing you. Now, uh, Brazil, this is new, and it's, I think it's, it's really scary. Uh, in addition to the police, now we're seeing local armed militia groups contest gang membership and ownership of different parts of the territory. The map, uh, red is criminal. Uh, I forget what the green is. It's also criminal, but it's a different, different group. But blue are these militia units. So you get a really interesting dynamic. Uh, and by the way, militia units that started off as we're of the people, for the people, by the people, they're now collecting protection money. They are threatening shop owners. If they don't cooperate, they will pay a price. And so as we saw in, for example, uh, Cape Town with a group called Pagad, People Against Gangsterism and Drugs, Pagad started out as a vigilante force that was going to work for the locals and became quickly became yet another criminal organization extorting the locals to uh, keep them in business. The question of environmental health in cities has long been an issue. Um, in some places, this is compounded, perhaps as in India, where animals are allowed to roam free. Uh, the ability of, when I first came up with this idea, by the way, there are people who said, this is a wonderful idea. For our cities, where you have animal and city farming and ranching and chicken growing, it's great. True, if you have the veterinary services, the medical checkups, the, the proper way of disposing of waste, et cetera. If you're not, it simply adds to the Petri dish, which is a city. Uh, and this is, these pictures go back to SARS. Uh, many people lost their livelihood in South Asia when entire ducks, your entire, if you own ducks, your entire duck population was taken up and killed to prevent the spread of SARS. Uh, the woman up right, she's losing her livelihood and she may be losing what amounts to pets. Uh, this is really grim. Uh, the, the young man on the boat is collecting trash that he can be, he can resell as salvage. Uh, and that's a river, he said. So interesting dichotomy here. You have the 10 most polluted cities 
This has not changed very much. One in India, I'm sorry, one, uh, two in Pakistan, one in China, and the rest are in India. And it's everything from what, how do you generate your power? How do you handle street pickup, et cetera? And then there's the unhealthy cities. And this was done by a, a tourist company. And the criteria are very different. And this stands as a reminder to watch your surveys and make sure you know what they're talking about. Because for example, um, yes, Mexico City is unhealthy, but so is New York and Washington DC and London and Sao Paulo and Paris. Um, and what they looked at among other things were you know, how many of the city dwellers are obese? And what's your life expectancy? The happiness level, which is an interesting way of, uh, they have an interesting way of determining that. How much does a gym membership cost? If it's too expensive, no, you know, how many people work out basically? How many hours of sunshine do you get? Which is interesting because you think you'd see you know, a lot of, uh, you know, where's Stavanger and where's Oslo and uh, Vladivostok, but that perhaps that's often by average, offset by average hours worked and outdoor activities. So that's a, you, while you can get a list of 10 worst, it's a very different list than you know, what 10 cities top the scale and killing people or are most polluted. Uh, it's interesting how some of these do correlate with the other list. Okay, to so Tijuana, the environmental thing. This is a, a great little example. The Tijuana River, uh, for years and years and years, was a well-regulated little waterway. Uh, and then Tijuana exploded in size. Lots of irregular settlements went up. And the number of people in Tijuana exceeded the, the city's ability to handle its sewage, uh, particularly when heavy rainstorms swept through. So the picture in the upper left is a fecal bloom, lovely word. And the current runs south to north. So all that yuck gets carried into California. As a, as a Navy brat growing up in Coronado on the beaches there, when you start talking about shutting beaches in South California, that's worse than shutting beaches in New England for shark attack. So the, the people, the good people of San Diego and others, uh, their first effort was we'll scoop this up and we'll send it back to Mexico. Well, you can imagine how poorly that worked. And instead they have been supporting with money, et cetera, building more chemical plants, more sewage plants in Mexico proper, in, in the Tijuana area. They still get overwhelmed and have these storms, but it certainly helped. And it's a, an example of a transnational threat. Uh, pollution does not always abide by boundaries and requires cooperation as opposed to confrontation sometimes to fix. Um, global warming is indeed an issue. Uh, I won't bore you with how much land can be lost. These are the uh, four continents that uh, if you have a major rise in water, what happens? You see that Florida disappears, et cetera. But basically, um, if food security is menaced, migration increases, people tend to leave farms for cities. That migration puts more pressure on cities that are already under heavy pressure. And then you have food shortages and other things to go with it. It makes a bad situation worse. Almost to the end. Civil society, all right, and this is one. This is a category I added because the great mystery was all these cities kept being on the list over and over again. They were going to fail. They were going to go feral, and yet they didn't quite do that. And then I think the difference was civil society, that glue that holds us together. How strong is it? Uh, it also was as a way of making making the unthinkable okay. There was a great line from a person who lived in Johannesburg for a year, and he said in South Africa. People get used to conditions that would be unacceptable anywhere else. So I think you see that. And what makes civil society? Well, the upper two are actually um, NGOs for peace. Um, they're protesting violence or they want to have uh, help victims of, of battles. And the, the Johannesburg one that stopped nuclear development of power in South Africa. Clearly, religion is a piece of civil society. We see that in Islamic societies, but this is the Pope visiting Brazil where he influences a lot of people. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, Parley, all can produce civil societies. There was a study that said the, the game World of Warcraft, if that was a country, it'd be the fifth largest country in the world. And it's certainly true that if, and those of you who belong to certain groups may feel more akin with members of your groups in India or Japan or the West Coast, than you do with your neighbor three houses down. And then we've, civil society is not always positive. Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and this day ISIS were elements of a society that bounded together much like a civil society, not for a purpose we would consider productive. Uh, in the United States today, this was, this, was a, this was a good year or a bad year for city studies. Uh, the rise of Antifa, 
uh, and just what they are, but they're clearly a presence now in the political scene of the United States, but also far right-wing extremists. So the FBI now identified as the number one source of domestic terrorism in the United States. Uh, this one, this uh, slide is dedicated to the Boogaloo Boys, who are white racist um, irredentists who want to do away with the U.S. government, replace it with a kind of a white society. Um, these are not good developments. COVID nineteen, COVID nineteen was just breaking out last year, and when I started looking at this, and we're, there was some interesting quote: what, "What will it do? What will the effect be?" And the answer is, it makes everything harder. Um, it puts more pressure on green cities. It puts a lot more pressure on those that are at the bottom of the scale. Um, and as structures break down, the movement begins to move toward virality, not toward a better city. Um, cities have become epicenters of the disease. And the adverse effects fall, not surprisingly, most heavily upon the poor. That's what the UN concluded in this year as we know of their cities. Some example, in the Northern Triangle of uh, South America, where most of the refugee flows are originating from, uh, social services and medical services have been overwhelmed by COVID, uh, which again, more pressure on people, more uh, impetus to move and get out. In Nigeria, um, hunger, they, they tried to lock down and, be the, and do the safe medical thing, but because the food distribution was a problem and food resources were a problem, people were driven out of their homes to find something to eat. Now, there are also issues with transportation. If you don't have a private car, you've got to ride the bus. That means you're exposed to more people. If you shut down bus lines, then you've got to walk further or take your bicycle further. I guess one positive indicator, it has been an uptick in bicycle sales and use. And then in Dharavai, poor sanitation made this issue worse. Not perhaps surprising. All right. Um, COVID is linked to demonstrations, which may be peaceful, but also may become violent. This is global, a global map of COVID-19 demonstrations. And the ones that are, are orange were accompanied by violence. There's a couple in the United States. Most of them obviously were in India, South America, and other places. Oh, by the way, if you notice that Canada looks great or Oceania, it's just because there was no data from them. Uh, with the United States, uh, again, a little more, uh, a little more granularity. Orange in this case is not political violence, it's the, re the protest were um, due to issues regarding whether or not schools would reopen. And in the United States, obviously, in this of the developed world, that was a really a surprise, at least to me, that uh, when you take children out of school, not only do you disrupt their education, which probably can be made up, but you know, if you have a, a two-income family now has to deal with the child at home, either your child has to take care of itself or you've got to bring in some form of supervision or you have to stay at home, which cuts into your earnings. So we're not immune to that. I'll come back to political violence in a second. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, my city, uh, in the aftermath of Katrina, the, the city of New Orleans, the state of Louisiana, the United States could not extend the rule of law into the Vera Carre. It was underwater. Uh, and so my city became feral for about five days. And then the water receded and control was reestablished. The, the repair has been phenomenal. The United States has a lot of resiliency, so power comes back on. There was a Mardi Gras that year, which is important if you're from New Orleans. Um, but one of the sad things is they didn't, they lacked the political will to repair the levees to a level that was required. And as a result, it's only a matter of a decade or so before another storm of the century hammers the levees of New Orleans. Uh, but because to, to, to take the levees from withstanding a force three cattle uh, hurricane to a force five hurricane would require displacing people, changing neighborhoods, uh, which are, those issues are fraught with political issues and so it just wasn't done. All right, Black Lives Matter erupted uh, this summer. Uh, for the most part, the summer still continues as a source of, of severe consternation. It was not us, it was us at our worst, not our, at our best. Um, and this is just an example of where Black Lives Matter related demonstrations, riots, et cetera, took place. So political violence over these issues is not, is not uh, different. We were, I think any normal US citizen was sickened and dismayed by the cases of Mr. Floyd, Ms. Taylor, et cetera. Um, but it, uh, it again, uh, it tore at the political fabric of the, of the country, but also at the political fabric of major cities. Um, look at how many cities now have Black Lives Matter in huge letters on some of their main thoroughfares and the reaction that that brought. Which brings me to Seattle. Again, if you'd ask me when I started this, are you going to see a U.S. city that goes feral? My answer would be no, absolutely not. 
there's too much redundancy, there's too much governance, there's too much of all the good stuff. And I missed Katrina because I didn't think about could this happen as a natural result? And the answer is sure. So if the, if the Yellowstone Caldera blows, if California gets the big one, you could easily see Fernali. But this I did not see. Uh, and Seattle's Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, which changed its name to the Capitol Hill Occupied Protest Zone, and that was done because those who were in charge felt it was becoming too much of a carnival. They wanted to remind people that it was a serious reaction to um, uh, related to Black Lives Matter and that it was more of a sit-in or an occupation than it was a party. And as a result, the, the city government of Seattle did not intrude into the zone. Uh, there were two shootings, there was some violence some store members thought it was good. Others asked for police help. Um, eventually, the barriers came down and police occupied. But this is what has me really thinking now about that next category in the diagnosis. And that's where's the political will? And I say that because there were other zones. Everybody knows about Portland, right? Portland's big one was the Red House, Chaz. It started 8 December. It came down in 14 uh, December. So it wasn't that long. But there was negotiations, there were apologies. In this case, it didn't have that kind of Woodstock feeling. From the beginning, there were booby traps, there were supposed to be weapons in the Red House that goes back to an eviction notice. Um, so that's another case where the city chose not to, to utilize the forces it had to restore its, its uh, sovereignty over that territory. And you can talk about, that might have been the right thing to do because if you're a city leader, you have to balance consequence uh, the cost of life if you take it over by storm, what happens after that. But you also have to then balance that against the continuing um, lack of your ability to govern part of your city. In Washington, D.C., there was going to be a Black House occupied zone. And that, in this case, an autonomous zone. It was right across the White House. Um, it went up at night on 22 June, and it was gone by the next day because D.C. police simply came in and dismantled it. If you're looking for a historical precedent, you might remember the bonus marchers in D.C. in 1922. Uh, these men who were demanding early payment of uh, bonds from World War I, uh, mostly they were veterans, um, established a shanty town in Anacostia. The U.S. government and the capital um, kind of, I would say, dithered as to what to do until after an election, in which case they sent the army in to demolish it. And that kind of, that uh, operation was run by Douglas MacArthur and his uh, chief of staff, or at least his adjutant, Dwight Eisenhower. And George Patton was in tanks and they flattened it. Uh, now in, the, in the Philadelphia, there was, a, I'm sorry, yeah, that, in Philadelphia, there was gonna be an autonomous zone for the uh, NGO Care Not Cops. Uh, it lasted less than an hour. But I don't wanna forget 6 January, 2021, um, whatever you call it, a putsch, a riot gone bad, I mean, sorry, a demonstration turned into a riot an occupation, an insurrection. And I think there are elements of all of those things. Um, it is something I thought I would never see in my lifetime. An, an angry mob, technically armed, breaking into the Congress, the Senate, uh, just uh, you know, the uh, very halls of power. Uh, yes, uh, back in the 50s, I'm sorry, the 40s, Puerto Rican nationalists managed to insert themselves into Congress and shot up the chamber, but at least they were terrorists. Uh, these are these are U.S. citizens, um, and so you get that whole shocking uh, device. And so this is my kind of my open question right now: uh, Is there a, a new category that should be put in? And that is, what is the political will of the, the city's leadership in dealing with challenges to its sovereignty, or its ability to provide services, or its ability to to um, create healthy bonds with civil society and their, their willingness to clean up their own act in terms of governance. And I'm thinking that might be another important indicator along the way. And with that, thank you for listening to my fire hose of information. I welcome your questions, although I don't promise to do a good job at answering, but I'll try my best. And I'll stop sharing now. And John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rick. Uh, Never a happy presentation. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> so uh, you've answered an awful lot of the questions as you went through your uh, remarks here, but let me put a couple unique ones out here. Uh, one uh, observer asked, is there any connection between colonialism and feral cities? 
in Africa, absolutely. But that's a much larger issue. There's a connection between colonialism and almost everything that's going not right on the African continent. When you abandon a country after holding uh, control of it for a century, as the Portuguese did in Mozambique, and you leave it with five PhDs and three MDs and a few lawyers, you're setting things up for failure. If you look at the Congo, uh, there are issues there. And it's certainly been argued that the way Africa was divided into the modern state, uh, split tribal units and demographic groups and been far more intelligent to do it differently. However, I would point out that when the OAU was founded, African leaders who had an opportunity to withdraw, to redraw the map, chose not to. Um, now, you can't blame everything that happens in Africa on colonialism. Africans have agency. It's been, in, in many cases, even though the most recent cases of independence, we're now going past the half century mark. But sure, colonialism did make it harder uh, on Africa. So uh, the, to that degree, yes. And by the way, if there's any students out there, my Colonial Wars class elective and my uh, Wars of African Independence electives are available uh, two out of the three semesters in the year. And we'd love to see you there. Thanks, John. I appreciate the commercial, but it's a great question. Should I mention my robot class? No, probably. Oh, sure. No, no. Probably not. We don't want to get this into a, uh, a, city, into a, of, a, city, of, a city of robots would not be feral. Anyway. That's true. Very much. Uh, interesting question. Uh, is there any gender component to feral cities? Is there any connection between female leadership and whether or not a city might be a feral city? That's a genius question. And my quick answer is, I don't know. My follow-on answer is, I want to know more. Um, you've got uh, um, Acting Chief Mukazi in Joburg. Uh, you certainly have uh, seen in Africa, for example, more women coming to senior leader uh, like uh, Mrs. Sirleaf in Liberia. Um, I would also say the indicators I would look at for that, and I think it's a really good idea, and I think it's a really good question. If you look at women, peace, and security, which does focus more on termination of war and military issues, security issues, and, and which no chance to plug the college, which I think one of the wellsprings is right here. Um, but women, peace, and security, when you involve women in peace negotiations, a conflict resolution, the conflicts last 30, on the average 35% longer than without them. It brings an entirely different point of view. And so I think uh, my guess is, and this is, I, I, I've been wrong many times, that the, as women become more included in city leadership, et cetera, that you may see more um, peaceful resolutions of these issues. Uh, Seattle, for example, had a woman mayor. Uh, there was a very vocal women member of uh, their, uh, their House of Representatives that, that cautioned against the use of force. And so, you know, you can make up, you can have a, a lot of opinions on you know, was that the right thing to do or not. But I would point out that it ended peacefully. It wasn't, it didn't require, you know, shooting, uh, mass shootings or anything like that or mass violence. Um, so I, my sense is the answer is probably yes, but I don't have anything to back that up other than the women, peace and security, which has gone beyond, it's an interesting idea to this is actual, this is as actuarial as somebody assessing your ability for life insurance, so. Uh, we're all interested in what's going on and uh, close to home. There've been another number of comments here about uh, Baltimore and St. Louis and other, other issues. This question is how much of a threat to the US do we believe exists from feral cities in Mexico? Oh, um, I was going to say in the U.S. That's a great. That's a good question. Um, I think we're we're clearly seeing issues in the expansion of violence and illegal activity over the border. Um, I think if Mexico, look, and you can't be too harsh on the Mexicans. The Mexicans have been the Mexicans have been at war with cartels for ten years. They've lost the equivalent of multiple army divisions, and they're fighting this war with their military right now. Um, and it's understandable that if you're the mayor of a small town in the northern tier of Mexico and the cartel rose up and they show you pictures of your children and they go, well, Mr. Mayor, you can either be mayor and look the other way or you won't be mayor and we'll kill your family. So there, there is some tremendous pressure on Mexican leadership. Um, but having said that, we are seeing spillover. And by the way, if Mexico loses this war, if the North goes, if it becomes a, um, if it becomes a, for lack of a better term, a, 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 a not a, a, you know, a cartelacy you know, with basically a criminal uh, criminal country, that's going to be bad for us. If Mexico melts down, people who think there's an immigration problem now, now you're going to see millions on the move. And so I think the potential is really high. I think right now it's contained along the border, but that's no longer quite the case, is it? When you talk about things like Mara Salvatucha 13, their gangs, 
they're active up in the, in the northern tier of the United States and big cities locally. So is it is it an existential threat to the United States? Probably not. Is it something that complicates our law enforcement and could grow to be much worse than it is? Sure. And, which, and I think this is why you have to cooperate with Mexico. It's a transnational issue. Um, you have to be sensitive to Mexican issues from their point of view. And so uh, it's a great question. And it's one that bears watching. Thank you. Uh, a question on the impact that uh, migrants, refugees, illegal refugees, et cetera, may have in turning an area into a feral city. Uh, what could the international community do perhaps to be more welcoming, more accepting, more integrative of these groups of people coming into a country? Well, there are several things, right? Um, if you can keep internally displaced people, and by the way, this is not my major area of expertise, my infinitely smarter and beautiful wife, Emily, that's kind of her area. But um, if you can perhaps uh, in, the, in the countries of origin provide services there, you might be able to, whether it's a safe haven or whatever, you might be able to stop the flow. You can increase services in the receiving countries, um, but it's, it's a hard challenge. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not because someone's gonna have to pay for it. Uh, you're gonna have to try to, and there are some really interesting demographic issues. We've seen this in Africa. Sometimes people live better in a refugee camp than they do in the surrounding environs. And that causes resentment for those people who don't get those kind of facilities. Um, by the way, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that life in a refugee camp is wonderful. It's not Club Med or anything like that. Um, so you have those issues. But I was going to say, funny, because I went a different way. Um, I, I thought it was going to be the classic migration refugee population for the U.S. Personal opinion, the United States has only benefited from refugees and migratory flows. While there are always disruptions, whether it's the Irish, the Italians, the Germans, Mexicans, the country as a whole has benefited. And now, if you're talking about cities, that gets interesting. Um, I lived in Miami for, for um, a brace of years. It was after the Haitian migration. But if you look at that, although the GDP of the United States did this, it didn't budge. Um, certainly the local politics, demographics, issues in the city of Miami changed mightily between the Cuban migration and the Haitian migrations that we saw post Castro and then later on when uh, Aristide was trying to return to power. So locally, you could have much more disruptive effects than you can, internet, I think, for the United States as a, as a nation. Best I can do, John. Several of the, uh, the observers today have suggested that maybe a category of something like resilience might be a good thing to add to your matrix. Uh, the degree to which a city or a nation can respond to whatever challenges it faces. That's a really smart comment. Um, I have certainly looked at resilience as a potential category. Right now I'm looking at it as an amalgam of governance services, uh, everything else that goes with it, but it, it could warrant its own. And uh, we see that, by the way, internationally. Uh, when a major earthquake hits the city in Afghanistan or um, in, in, the, in the Middle East, it takes years, decades sometimes to recover. Similar damage in U.S. cities are handled much more rapidly. Now, it's interesting because um, we're pampered. And there are studies that suggest that if you don't get your lights turned on, even if it's after a class five hurricane, which is like the Brillo pad of God scouring, you know, wide swath of territory. If we don't get our lights turned on by in 48 hours, we begin to blame the government for being unresponsive. Um, that's a pretty, if it's looking at a hurricane, Andrew or Katrina, that's a pretty hard standard to meet. And I think the reason, or, or a major snowfall up in New England, I, personally, I think we're a little overboard with superstorms, but in the case of a really violent hurricane level uh, nor'easter, you know, maybe giving the, the, the authorities more than two days to get the TV back on is a, is a little harsh. But um, we, do, we do expect resiliency out of our people and, our, and our, our, our leadership. And for the most part, we are. And again, New Orleans, I had, I had, I had friends from the North who you know, were basically comforting me saying, you'll get a Mardi Gras next year. And I said, oh, no, no, Cher, we're gonna have a Mardi Gras this year. And we did. It was kind of truncated, but that's just the spirit of New Orleans. No, nothing for the song, but it, you know, I, I had no doubt they might not have running water, but New Orleans would have a Mardi Gras. So I think there are these elements of U.S. culture that we we are more resilient in some ways. And I think for the most part, disasters brings out a, a, a really good side of us. But um, as, as for the, in terms of resiliency as a category, it's still on the possibility zone. But you got to be careful, otherwise I'm going to have a chart that's five by a hundred. Um, but I'm really so right now. So, um, uh, political will is uh, the leading contender, but resiliency has been in that in that stack. 
Well, the last question, and since you brought it up, is there going to be a Mardi Gras this year? Oh, yeah, absolutely. COVID, and how, how is uh, the city going to handle? Okay, poorly, I think. Well, it all depends where the vaccinations are, all right? And I, I suspect the city will handle it poorly because um, it's one thing to wear, not to, to, to get together as a, uh, as a political statement. The Mardi Gras is baked into the DNA of Louisiana. If, and, and, oh, again, I've been wrong, all right? So maybe my former neighbors and all that will not be silly or, or, or risky. If we, pack, if we pack the football stadium for the Super Bowl, my fellow New Orleanians will come out for the bra. So um, and it's just really hard to imagine they wouldn't. So hopefully the vaccinations are going into place and it'll be a joyous celebration as opposed to let's roll the dice and see if it's a super spreader event. All right, sir. Well, is there any final wrap-up comments you'd like to make, Rick? No, it's uh, just that this is a moving target. I would Once again, I have been wrong in my predictions before, so don't take them to the bank or more, especially don't take them to the stock exchange. Um, I encourage everybody to kind of watch this. I do think it's one of the emerging issues of the 21st century, and I'd like to thank the foundation, the Admiral, and my institution for being willing to be part of this. And I think it's kind of neat that of all the places, one of the places that we do research on feral cities is here at the Naval War College. So I wish everybody a good day and good luck. And uh, thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, excellent presentation. Admiral, did you have any comments as we wrap things up here before we shift to uh, family discussion group? Well, that was a really great lecture. Uh, a lot of new terminology for us and a, a way of thinking about things that maybe we haven't uh, always thought about in the past. And so I just want to thank Professor Norton and, uh, and all of the great uh, comments that came in uh, to tell us how you're thinking about this new material. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in to this Issues in National Security Affairs lecture series, and we hope that we'll see you again. Thank you. Now we'll take about a five minute pause here and then we'll come back for our family discussion group meeting. So five minutes and then we'll be back with you. Thank you. <laughs>